Adults can't learn perfect pitch, only babies can. This neatly sums up Biado's major argument. Two studies from 2019 claim to have taught adults perfect pitch, or absolute pitch as it's known in the literature. Also, check this out. And before you ask, this is without a reference note or tonality. I know the sound of each individual note, absolutely. C. G. B. A. G. E flat. C again. F. B flat. E. Real perfect pitch works like this. Fast as you can. A flat. C. G. S sharp. Now, I know that most musicians wouldn't accept being able to pass an atomized note test as evidence of perfect pitch. We'll come back to this. Incidentally, as part of my research, I've created an absolute pitch training experiment, which, for now at least, you can take part in by clicking the link in the video description. Right, let's now delve a little deeper into what Biado is saying in his video. Okay, so why can babies learn perfect pitch? Well, they don't actually learn it, they retain it. Babies can hear the sounds of all the phonemes of all the languages spoken on Earth. By the time a baby hits around nine months of age, they begin to lose the ability to hear all of these sounds. It can only hear the sounds of the language that are spoken in their household. When a parent interacts with a baby, the baby begins taking statistical analysis on the sounds they are hearing. They don't know any of the rules, they're just listening to the sounds. They're looking for patterns of repetition and sequences in sound. This is how babies learn their native language. Babies do the same thing with music. They take statistical analysis on the sounds they are hearing. There's a lot to unpack here. Beato doesn't cite his sources, but I presume he's basing his idea upon a 2001 study by Jenny Safran, titled Absolute Pitch in Infant Auditory Learning, Evidence for Developmental Reorganization. This is one of a series of studies by Safran in which she examined statistical learning in infants, initially in the realm of language, but later turning her attention to music. These studies rely upon what is known as the head turn preference procedure. It's worth us noting that this is extremely well validated in the linguistics literature. However, it may also raise a few eyebrows when we go into exactly how it works. A baby sits on the lap of a caregiver, for example, a parent, in a booth. And an observer controls the experiment and takes measurements outside of the booth via CCTV. During the experiment, both the caregiver and the observer listen to music through headphones so as to hopefully eliminate bias that is to say that the caregiver's own responses to the stimuli shouldn't be allowed to influence the babies, and similarly, the observer's personal responses shouldn't influence the observations. In Safran's experiments, each baby is first given a three-minute stream of continuous stimuli with which to become familiar. For this, the baby's gaze is first directed to a blinking light on the front wall of the booth, and then the stimuli stream is played from two loudspeakers located on the side walls. As they are played the stimuli, an attempt is made with the lighting to keep their interest. A blinking light above one of the two loudspeakers turns on, and the baby looks at it. When they seem to have lost interest, the light is switched off, and the central light is switched on until they return their gaze to the centre. At this point, another side light is turned on. It carries on like this until the stimuli stream is complete. The hope is that the babies have engaged with the stimuli during this period. After this stage, the babies are tested. Each trial also starts with the light at the front of the booth blinking. Once the baby is fixating on this, one of the side lights starts to blink and the central light is switched off. Once the observer judges the baby to have turned their head in the direction of the blinking light by at least 30 degrees, the test item is presented from the loudspeaker next to it. The test item is played a number of times until the baby eventually looks away from it. The time taken for this to happen is what's measured. I think it's fair for us to question how much we can infer from the head movements of babies. In her study, Safran takes the length of time that the baby spends looking in the direction of the loudspeaker to indicate how novel the stimuli are to them. The idea is that they are less interested in stimuli that they recognise better. Couldn't you also argue the opposite? What's to say that they wouldn't be more interested in stimuli that they recognise better? 
From what I understand, it appears to be down to each individual researcher to decide what exactly the measurements mean in this regard. Should that concern us? And how confident are we that their head movements indicate anything about recognition at all? This paradigm is well attested to in the literature, for sure, but I still think it's important that we ask these types of questions. And how does this all relate to perfect pitch? Well, the first thing to note is that it doesn't exactly. Saffron made it explicit that she was testing for absolute pitch memory rather than the ability to label those pitches. Given there is evidence that all people have a degree of absolute pitch memory, for example, we often intuitively sing songs that we know well in the correct key, surely the ability to actually label these pitches is what most of us would see as perfect pitch. In her work on language, she was interested in what are called transitional probabilities between syllables. These refer to the probability of one syllable occurring given the previous syllable. Syllables within a word have a higher transitional probability than syllables across word boundaries. An example that she gives is the sequence pretty baby. Within this, the likelihood of the syllable pri being followed by the syllable t is quite high, while the probability of the syllable t being followed by the syllable bay is quite low. The idea is that babies might, in essence, make these kinds of calculations as they learn to segment speech sounds. Saffron showed that eight-month-old babies were able to segment nonsense syllables based upon artificially designed statistical regularities. For the study we're looking at, she constructed three-note musical words and part words. For example, words included A flat B flat F, C D flat E flat, B F sharp G, and A D E. At the familiarization stage, the babies were played continuous streams comprised from these words. At testing, they were played the latter two words, B, F sharp, G, and A, D, E, as well as two part words. These were identical to the words, except that they were a tritone away. So, F, C, D flat, and E flat, A flat, B flat, instead of B, F sharp, G, and A, D, E. They were called part words, as they were constructed from the beginnings and endings of the two words that weren't included in testing. Saffron found that the babies listened to the part words for, on average, one second longer than the words, which she took as evidence that the babies recognised the words, but were less familiar with their intervallically identical, but, with regard to their absolute pitches, less common counterparts. This was a statistically significant result, but how impressed are we by it? She then ran a follow-up experiment to see whether babies were able to segment pitch words on the basis of their relative pitch content. This was a flawed experiment. As an example, one of her words was an A-flat rising to a B-flat and falling to an F. Her part word equivalent was an A-flat rising to a B-flat then falling to an E-flat. The B-flat falling to an F is both absolutely and relatively different to the B-flat falling to an E-flat. She considered the B-flat falling to an E-flat to mean that the stimulus was only novel relatively. Her reasoning was that the B-flat to E-flat tone pair had appeared in another word. But within this other word, the B-flat had similarly fallen to E-flat, meaning that the tone pair was not only identical in an absolute sense, but in a relative sense also. Unsurprisingly, she didn't get a significant result for this. She took this to mean that babies don't segment on the basis of relative pitch but I suspect the lack of result actually reflects the flawed design. She tops off the study by investigating how adults responded on the same two experiments. Except for the adults, as you might expect, she didn't use the head turn paradigm. She used forced choice judgments instead. The adult participants were instructed to indicate the most familiar sequence on each trial. Once she had excluded adults who reported having perfect pitch, she found the adult musicians' scores in experiment 1 didn't exceed chance, and that their scores in experiment 2 did. Given the design flaws in experiment 2, it isn't clear what this result means. The result from experiment 1 could easily be explainable by the vague requirement to indicate the most familiar tone sequence. Most people understand the idea that happy birthday can be sung from any starting note. Presumably we would hear it as familiar from any starting note which is to say that we recognise it as happy birthday. So, are we surprised that adults may have deemed intervallically identical stimuli to be familiar? The adults were never asked to pick out identical stimuli. 
Rick Beato takes the idea that children learn absolute pitch categories through statistical learning to be a given. But now that we've looked into this study, how confident are we in this? The image that Beato paints is of babies acting as basic information processors. But this isn't the case. They are intensively interacted with and are intensive interactors. We need human interaction to learn language. The face-to-face -face element is very important. There may be an element of statistical learning at play, but it's very far from the full picture. Babies aren't just learning a few words, they're learning how to have conversations. Regardless, he makes a strong claim that we learn absolute pitch categories through statistical learning, and the available evidence doesn't seem to support this. It does seem to be the case that newborn babies tune into the contrastive relationships among the speech sounds that constitute the fundamental components of their first languages, and, from about six months onwards, they are much less able to do this for speech sounds from other languages. But how, or indeed if, this relates to perfect pitch isn't clear. When they're exposed to unpredictable, highly complex music, like Bach's C-sharp major prelude from the second book of the Well-Tempered Clavier, that has all these unexpected modulations, that's when the babies open up that gate and begin to take statistical analysis on the sounds. They need unexpected twists and turns. That's how babies learn. They learn by things. They don't learn by things that are predictable. They learn by things that are unpredictable. That's why modern jazz, with its unpredictable cadences, played by the greatest players in the world, like Keith Jarrett and John Coltrane and Charlie Parker and Miles Davis, when babies hear that music, that's when they start taking notes on the notes. I'm not sure how Biado has arrived at this point from his argument about statistical learning. At this point in the video, he's literally just said that babies look for patterns of repetition and sequences in sound. But now he's saying they don't learn by things that are predictable? It does, however, seem that children learn the predictable rules first. For example, they take some time to learn to say things like I went and I saw, preferring the more obvious but grammatically incorrect I goed and I seed. This is called overgeneralization. They learn the rule of add ed to past tense, and then they learn the exceptions later. Listen, I'm a jazz musician myself. Trust me, I would love it if the golden answer to teaching children perfect pitch were just to play them loads of hip jazz and hope for the best. But sadly, I don't see any reason to presume this is true. My concept is to play babies really sophisticated music, what I call high information music. And if a baby hears enough of these, they don't learn by predictable sounds. They learn by unpredictable things. Babies always learn by unpredictable things. That's why you need to play jazz and things that have unexpected modulations, resolutions, things like that, or modern classical music. Okay, so we've covered that there really isn't any empirical support for this idea. It's an interesting, if unlikely, theory. If you really want to see if your high information music approach has any weight behind it, then perhaps you should construct an experiment to find out. The fact that you played a single child a load of hip music when he was a baby and now he has perfect pitch really doesn't amount to evidence. There are so many factors that could have led to his having developed it. Incidentally, while we're on this topic, in 1984, Grabelnik was able to teach absolute pitch to five children aged between three and four by training them to associate every note and key center with 12 Russian folk songs. In societies that speak tonal languages like Mandarin or Vietnamese, perfect pitch is 30% higher, the incidence of it. And that's factored into the one in 10,000 number. So tonal languages, because pitch is so important to the meaning of the language, it takes on greater importance to the babies to be able to recognize these. Before we even get onto tone languages, Let's talk about this 1 in 10,000 statistic. The earliest source for this appears to be Backham in 1954, but it seems to have been something of a stab-in-the-dark estimate. Patrick Bermudez and Robert Zator have found that while it's relatively easy to distinguish people who don't have absolute pitch, test scores of those thought to have it are actually quite widely distributed. There's a cluster of people that achieve perfect or near-perfect scores, but then lots of others perform well, but notably less well with a widespread of scores. Stephen Van Hedger and his team have found performance to be continuously distributed and highly variable. There is a big discussion as to how absolute pitch should be defined and measured. As such, 
1 in 10,000 statistic is a little meaningless. Beato's 30% figure comes from a study by Peter Gregerson, where he discovered a significant correlation between having absolute pitch and being of an East Asian ethnicity. In this, he had 2,707 music students at music conservatories and at university and college music programs in the United States complete a questionnaire on their absolute pitch ability and whether other family members of theirs had it. 32.1% of Asians had absolute pitch, as compared to 7% of non-Asians. I should point out that Gregerson's study was on music students, so Beato's claim that 30% of all people in societies that speak tone languages have it isn't accurate. Also, this figure is likely to include Asians whose native languages are not tone languages. His claim that people who speak tone languages are more likely to develop absolute pitch is based upon a set of fairly dubious studies from Diana Deutsch. Fascinated by Gregerson's finding of an East Asian advantage for absolute pitch, she noted that many East Asian languages are tone languages. She questioned if absolute pitch might be learnt in childhood as a feature of language, and like language, she supposed, might not be learnable after a critical period. In tone languages, the way in which you say a word totally changes the meaning of the word. For example, in Mandarin, the word ma has four different tones. If it is high and level, it means mother. If it starts low and ends high, it means hemp. If it starts fairly high, dips very low, and then comes back up again, it means horse. And if it starts high and ends low, it means scold. Ma, 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 ma. The critical period is a period in adolescence, after which, it's hypothesised, people are unable to fully learn a first language. Obviously, you'll struggle to find an ethics board that will allow you to run an experiment in which you don't teach a child language. There are, however, cases of feral children that can provide some evidence. One particularly sad case is that of Jeannie the Wild Child. From the age of 20 months old until she was 13 and a half, she was kept locked in a room by her father, she was left malnourished and isolated, and was barely exposed to language. As such, she didn't acquire one in childhood. When she was rescued, attempts were made to teach her language. A study by Susan Curtis observed that Jeannie was able to learn vocabulary at a rate that outstripped all expectations, but she struggled with grammar to the extent that she was never able to fully learn a language. This is a famous case that provides some evidence for the critical period hypothesis. Diana Deutsch actually built her case around the theory that there is a critical period for learning second languages, such that you could pass for a native speaker. The idea of a critical period for second language acquisition is highly contested, with most agreeing that it is in fact possible, but it's also very difficult. We can raise the question of motivation. If people can already understand you perfectly well, then, unless you're a spy, or have some other compelling reason, why bother going through the considerable effort of going accent-free? However, there certainly is evidence for a critical period for first language acquisition, so let's consider her work in that context. In a somewhat strange experiment, she examined how consistently people naturally pitch spoken words on different days. She compared Mandarin speakers, so tone language speakers, to English speakers, and intonation language. She had participants read a list of words twice on two different days and then compared the pitch, as calculated by a slightly odd averaging system, at which they were spoken, both within days and between days. Mandarin speakers were significantly more consistent between days. However, let's consider the scale of the difference that we're talking about here. Taking percentages of all of each group's between day scores, 90% of Mandarin speakers spoke the words within a semitone of each other. However, 71% of English speakers were also within a semitone. So realistically, most people from both groups spoke within a semitone. And also, more importantly perhaps, what does this have to do with absolute pitch? Why was she measuring this in the first place? The term tone language might sound like people are talking at deliberately pitched tones, but realistically, starting a word low and ending high is both gestural and relative. If the absolute pitch of the word doesn't actually imbue meaning in either language, then surely the most fascinating thing about the findings is that all of the participants did nonetheless speak at so close to the same pitch on both days. There is a musical quality to all languages. 
The fact that meaning can be derived from the shape of your spoken utterances seems to have very little to do with absolute pitch memory. The East Asian advantage might be seen to support a genetic argument. As such, Deutsch ran a follow-up study in which she held genetic factors constant, exploring a possible relationship with tone language fluency with only participants of an East Asian ethnic heritage living in America. She found that very fluent participants performed better on an absolute pitch test than fairly fluent speakers, and that they also didn't demonstrate a significant difference from the previously tested Mandarin speakers who lived in China. She also found that non-fluent speakers didn't differ significantly from non-tone language speaking Caucasians. Furthermore, she found that having come to America late or early didn't have an effect on the results. I just don't buy the tone language theory. It feels like an odd and forced explanation for what she has observed. Another explanation for her results might come from the perceived cultural importance of absolute pitch. In fact, this is an argument that Peter Gregerson made in his original study, and we'll explore it more in a minute. Let's say that absolute pitch is more culturally important in countries where a tone language is spoken. We could ask why fairly fluent speakers are only fairly fluent. Perhaps parents who have raised very fluent speakers are also more likely to strongly maintain aspects of the culture from which their language originates. Perhaps there are differences in the musical training that these participants have received. Interestingly, Stephen Van Hedger and Howard Nussbaum, in a study where both tone and intonation language speakers scored almost perfect scores on a standard absolute pitch test, found that tone language speakers actually responded less accurately when presented with more challenging timbres and octaves. So, other than a possible genetic advantage, perhaps Gregerson's findings can be explained by culture-specific traits, such as a greater tendency to spot children with absolute pitch and to push them into music education, or having an education system that helps children to develop it. Maria Varaka has examined the perceived cultural importance of absolute pitch in Japan as compared to Greece. She found that 40 of the 82 Japanese undergraduate music students that she tested had absolute pitch, as compared to just two of 117 Greek students. She found that significantly more of the Japanese students had begun learning an instrument before the age of six, and that 83% of them had taken preschool training in a fixed dome method, as compared to just 4.2% of Greek students. The fixed dome methods that she's referring to in the study are the Yamaha and Suzuki methods. Both have been implicated in absolute pitch learning in children, and the former has in particular, she also noted that absolute pitch wasn't even included in Greek musical dictionaries, which gives an indication of its comparative cultural importance. In a recent study contrasting absolute and relative pitch performances in East Asian and Western countries, Kenichi Miyazaki also cited influences of the underlying socio-cultural conditions, presumably relating to music education, as a likely explanation for the discrepancy. The point here with regard to Biado's video is that the tone language theory is ripe for criticism and certainly can't be presented with the confidence that he presents it with. Let's move on to another study that he talks about. This is a 2013 study that says Velproit reopens critical period learning of absolute pitch. This study talks about Velproit, which is a very powerful anti-seizure medicine. They discovered that its use reopened the plasticity of the brain in adults and it made it possible for them to develop perfect pitch. So hang on a minute. You're saying adults can develop perfect pitch then? Let's explore this study a bit. Judith Gavain and her team ran an experiment where participants attempted to learn to associate pitches with common names, such as Sarah, David, Francine, Jimmy, and Karen, while on a program of the drug Valproate. Valproate is a type of histone deacetylase inhibitor, and these have been shown to help adult mice to establish perceptual preferences that would otherwise be impossible after youth. They hoped that it might similarly help adult men to perform critical period-like learning. The study suffers from notable flaws, however. The training and testing was only ever for six of the twelve pitches at any time, and these appeared in just three octaves. They also never performed a pretest for absolute pitch for which to compare the post-test results. Also, the actual training only took place for seven days, which seems unrealistically short. Participants in the Valproate condition performed significantly above chance, whereas the placebo group were at chance level. However, the vast majority of the Valproate responses were nonetheless wrong. 
The peak for correct responses was roughly twice the size of the peaks for each of the other notes, which isn't that impressive. Naturally, the next highest peak was for the note to try turn away, which in musical terms could be seen as the worst mistake possible. Interestingly, this correct note followed by one a try turn away pattern was also evident in the placebo group, but clearly there wasn't a significant peak for the correct note here. You might be tempted to say that, as the training was for only seven days, this could indicate that it's possible to learn the skill more seriously with more training time. But this is guesswork. As it is, this study doesn't demonstrate a lot. Okay, let's look at some other things that Beato says. Memorizing an F sharp and having perfect pitch are two very different things. Couldn't agree more. It's an instantaneous thing. There is no referencing another note. Yep, absolutely. Interestingly, a number of early training attempts in the literature did, somewhat misguidedly, attempt to train perfect pitch in this way. You can trace this back to Salomon Yadison, who in 1899 suggested students should use a tuning fork and an in-tune instrument to learn to recall a single fundamental tone without an external reference tone. Once they had done this, they were expected to deduce the other notes using relative pitch, which he asserted would then develop into absolute pitch eventually. The composer, Paul Hindemith, suggested pretty much the same thing. He reckoned about 80 to 100 goes at remembering an A, checking yourself against a tuning fork, should do the trick. After which, presumably, you'd learn all of the other notes by reference to it as you work through his oral training exercises. Of people that weren't able to do this, he said... The question may be raised whether there is any musical gift at all in a mind that cannot learn to remember and compare pictures. Influenced by Hindemith's thoughts, in 1968, Lola Cuddy tested an approach she called A-training on six participants. Using randomised sign tones from within a single octave, running from E4 to E flat 5, she trained participants to recognise occurrences of the note A. She did this by presenting five progressive levels of difficulty, whereby the probability of A appearing decreased successively from 1 in 2 to 1 in 12, for the musicians at least. For non-musicians, it decreased to 1 in 8. Feedback was provided in training, but not testing, and participants could only progress between levels when they were making at most two errors. In training, participants were instructed to call A if they heard it, whereas in testing, they wrote A and wrote X for all the other pitches. She went on to run a bunch of similar experiments to this, as did some others, including Paul Brady. Brady's method was essentially Cuddy's A training, but using a three-octave range of stimuli, and focusing on C rather than A. He had only one participant in his study, himself. Throughout training, he actively attempted to recognise notes by relation to the C. By the final round, he would have presumably internalised the C, and so was making relative pitch judgments from there. Once the training was complete, 57 consecutive mornings, having just woken up, he had his wife test him on his ability to recognise a randomly played note on the piano. He achieved 47 correct responses, so 65%, 18 errors by a semitone, 31.5%, and two errors by a whole tone, 3.5%. Six months later, he correctly identified four out of five notes played on a flute, each interspersed with three minutes of conversation to supposedly limit relative pitch use. Five years later, he was given an absolute pitch test, where he performed similarly to a group that had possessed absolute pitch since childhood. However, this particular test involved participants playing their responses on the piano, thus allowing for relative pitch use. What's more, he explicitly didn't complete it with absolute pitch. As he said himself, he learnt the note C and recognised all the other notes within a C major framework. Unsurprisingly, he wrote that the entire mechanism collapses on hearing a fragment, a few seconds, of music played in a key other than C. It beggars belief that this study has been cited so many times as an instance of someone having taught themselves absolute pitch. In 1937, Backham listed several different types of absolute pitch. He split the ability into three main types, genuine absolute pitch, quasi-absolute pitch, and pseudo-absolute pitch. These were then split into several subtypes. Genuine absolute pitch could be universal, limited, or borderline. The universal type included infallible recognition for every range of musical tones, including noises. It also included a fallible form, where recognition was strong for most musical instruments, but people would make some semitone and octave errors. Absolute pitch might also be limited as to timbre, 
For example, you might have absolute pitch, but only for the piano. And as to region, which is to say you might recognise notes that are found in the middle of the piano, but struggle with notes that are higher or lower than that. Borderline cases would include having some, often inaccurate, absolute pitch ability, which could be quite variable, so strong at some times, but weaker at others. People who remember just one or two notes to work out everything else from were described as having quasi-absolute pitch. These notes might be remembered from how they sound on a particular instrument, or when sung. So there you go, Rick Beato. You're describing quasi-absolute pitch. Not only do people agree with you that what you're describing isn't genuine absolute pitch, but they have in fact done so since 1937. Backham's final type was pseudo-absolute pitch, which would mean having a fairly rough sense of where the pitches are based upon tone height. Even these definitions aren't completely satisfying. David Ross has provided evidence for two distinct types of absolute pitch. Notes that in the learning and memory process, the initial registration of information is called encoding. Absolute pitch encoders are said to encode pitches automatically and absolutely using a process that is independent of the ability to name the notes and which doesn't require their attention. They're able to discern small differences in tuning and recognise non-musical stimuli well, for example, buzzes and beeps. By contrast, people with heightened tonal memory tend to remember having gained absolute pitch at some point. They rely upon an enhanced ability to evoke and to form memories of specific pitch examples, for example, the pitches on their own instrument. And this process is often incumbent upon motor memory, so remembering the action of playing an instrument. Often their absolute pitch is limited by range or by timbre. Absolute pitch encoders might encode at the point of perception, heightened tonal memory might take place at a different, later stage. So to summarise, yes, Rick Beato, we all agree with you that absolute pitch judgments are instantaneous and don't involve referencing a single internalised note. So I guess if I tried harder, then I would have perfect pitch. I always use the example that of all the people I know that teach ear training at Berkeley, at Juilliard, at Eastman, all the greatest schools in the world, none of them have ever had a student come in that didn't have perfect pitch and left with perfect pitch. If it's so easy to do, why don't they have perfect pitch training at conservatories? You would think that they would have thought about that by now after three or four hundred years of music schools. Um, literally nobody has said that it's easy to do. Here's the deal. The most successful scientific attempts to train absolute pitch to adults were made in 2019. It is clear that people do often develop a sense of heightened tonal memory from familiarity with the instrument that they play. By many definitions of absolute pitch, and certainly by the layman's definition, perhaps not by the musicians, this counts. They can hear and produce pitches absolutely without the need for an external reference note or tonality. So people in conservatories, or conservatoires as we call them here in the UK, develop and hone absolute pitch of a sort, all of the time. Why don't they officially teach it? There isn't a developed methodology to teach it. Not only is the learnability of absolute pitch an open question, but the very definition of absolute pitch is still open. You say, so I guess if I tried harder, then I would have perfect pitch. No, not at all. It depends on your methodology. If this is how you try to train yourself... Hey. Hey. Then it clearly doesn't matter how hard you try. That's not going to work. So what I'd say is this. Trying harder won't necessarily help, but trying better might. A neuroscientist ought to know better. If he's really, truly a neuroscientist, he should know that adults cannot develop perfect pitch. Is this neuroscientist's work on perfect pitch? Why should he know that adults cannot learn it? If he's a neuroscientist, then he should presumably know about neuroscience. Of course, if he's a neuroscientist studying absolute pitch, then there are a few things that he should probably know. One particular area of interest to absolute pitch researchers is a part of the brain called the planum temporal, which, on the left side, is located in the heart of Wernicke's area, which has been associated with the comprehension of written and spoken language. It can be found just behind the auditory cortex. Studies by Gottfried Schlaug and Julian Keenan have found that for absolute pitch possessors, this area is slightly larger on the left-hand side and notably smaller on the right. When it comes to white matter, which is basically the brain wiring, there are disagreements about how well-connected absolute pitch brains are. There is some agreement that anatomically they are well-connected locally, but poorly connected across the whole brain. There are disagreements about their functional connectivity, however. 
Psyche Louie found evidence that brain function is well connected across the whole brain, but Christian Brauchley has found evidence for diminished whole brain connectivity. Neuroscientists have also looked at the unique timing of electrical brain responses to various musical stimuli. Using EEG, generally speaking, a response at or under 200 milliseconds is regarded to be early, so pretty automatic, and over 250 milliseconds is seen as late, implying some kind of cognitive processing has taken place. Some of the earliest evidence for this came from Mark Klein in 1984. He used what's called an oddball procedure, where you present participants with a mixture of frequent and rare stimuli. Usually the rare stimuli produce a large electrical response around 300 milliseconds later. But for absolute pitch possessors, this was found to be small or absent for musical stimuli. He took this as evidence that non-absolute pitch possessors are constantly maintaining or updating their working memory, while the possessors don't need to. Other researchers have found a larger response for absolute pitch possessors at 100 milliseconds, and a tendency towards a larger response at 200 milliseconds. I could go on. There's a lot of neuroscientific work in this field, and I'm really just scratching the surface here. The point is that a neuroscientist, if they knew anything about absolute pitch, would know that the available evidence points in a few different and conflicting directions. The fact is that differences in brain activity are to be expected. We know that absolute pitch musicians are completing the task differently. This is what we're investigating in the first place. Even the brain anatomy studies aren't actually damning to the idea that absolute pitch might be learnable. Apart from anything, there are cases of stroke victims regaining function when the areas of their brains that should be responsible for it are dead. What's clear is that brains seem to be pretty damn plastic. I've interviewed some of the most famous musicians in the world. Palang. The idea that these people somehow didn't try hard enough is ridiculous. These are the greatest players in the world. If anybody was going to develop perfect pitch, they would have developed it. Hmm. That doesn't actually follow, does it? If they don't know how to develop it, and perhaps aren't even fussed about developing it, then why would you expect them to? I think we can all agree with you that you don't need perfect pitch to be a great musician. When people tell me, oh, you just didn't try hard enough, you need to practice, it's ridiculous. Also, you can go on YouTube and there are perfect pitch channels that will play one note for 30 minutes. It will play a sine wave, it will play a synthesizer, it'll play somebody singing and it'll name the notes. That is a waste of time. Too true. Taking that approach certainly is a waste of time. So what about these 2019 studies that claim to have actually taught participants absolute pitch? Both of these defined absolute pitch by the ability to achieve over a certain percentage of correct responses on various absolute pitch tests using atomized single note stimuli. The majority of the absolute pitch literature relies on tests like this, which I see as a big problem. A more nuanced understanding of absolute pitch involves a lot more than being able to recognize or indeed produce single acontextual pitches absolutely. These tests, as far as I'm concerned, don't accurately measure the ability as it would be judged in the real world. I suspect that one of the reasons we tend to see a wide range of mid-range scores and then a cluster of very high scores is that tests like these aren't capable of teasing apart the abilities of these high achievers. Perhaps we have a ceiling effect. One of the studies came from Stephen Van Hedger, Shannon Heald and Howard Nussbaum. In this, they managed to train absolute pitch, as defined by the literature, to two of six participants. Over an eight-week period, they focused separately on speed and accuracy. Their stimuli used a range of timbres. The speed tasks involved picking out target notes from a string of stimuli within a limited time window, and the accuracy tasks involved accurately labelling the pitch of a presented note with unlimited time. After four weeks, the task notably increased in difficulty, and another task was added in which participants were asked to recognise the keys of excerpts of music. Feedback was provided in training, but not in testing. Two of the participants passed the criterion for absolute pitch on two of the three note tests administered. Only one of them passed all three tests. Notably, the scores on the key recognition test, which we could argue is a better measure for absolute pitch, weren't very impressive. So, it's an interesting and promising experiment, but can we really say with confidence that these participants learnt absolute pitch? The other study came from Yetta Wong, who managed to train it to six, out of 43, participants. These six are actually the collected successes of three different, but similar, training approaches. 
Participants started with three pitches to recognise, and the remaining pitches were added successively as participants achieved high enough scores to pass each section. Tasks included recognising whether a pitch name presented on screen was the same as a heard pitch, and recognising pitches as heard. Feedback was provided for most rounds, but to move between levels, participants would be required to pass a round without feedback provided. One of the training approaches also included an extra round, where after 10 attempts to pass a level, they would be given a round of training that honed in on the note they had achieved the worst overall score for. Again, this experiment relied on a definition of absolute pitch based upon achieving a certain percentage of correct scores on a single notes test. So, where are we at, and what do I have to say to Rick Biardo? Rick Biardo's video wasn't completely wrong. He did cite some important and interesting findings from the literature. What was wrong was to present them with such confidence. The absolute pitch literature is alive and very messy. Currently, it raises a lot more questions than it answers. The claim that adults can't learn perfect pitch isn't supported by the literature. It is an open question that is still being researched. Do I have perfect pitch? I've trained myself to be able to pass the kinds of absolute pitch tests that appear in the literature, so in one sense the answer is yes. I think by a layman's definition it's certainly yes. I have party trick perfect pitch. Play me a note on the piano and I'll tell you what it is. But I also know lots of musicians that can do what I can do, and often more impressively, that wouldn't count themselves as having perfect pitch. I can recognise and produce notes absolutely, I can hear out the notes and chords absolutely, but I find it much more difficult when there's a lot more information to process. Usually in real-life musical situations, where I'm presented with fast-moving real-time music, with my bass player bashing out notes below me and a saxophonist playing away above me, I end up falling back on my relative pitch. I certainly hear parts of the music absolutely, so perhaps this is just a stage in my development. But as it stands, it's too much information for me to take in the whole picture absolutely when performing. For someone like Jacob Collier, I'm presuming that this isn't the case at all. He very undoubtedly has perfect pitch. I do also hold a theory that whichever approach you learn first will provide you with your fastest access point to the pitches. A large part of the problem with learning absolute pitch may be that you access the notes more immediately and intuitively with relative pitch. And this probably works vice versa too. Absolute pitch musicians may hear the absolute notes first and have to work harder to hear and feel the relative qualities. This may be one of the obstacles that we need to overcome from whichever starting point we have. So, what does this mean? Do I have a lower form of perfect pitch that I can train up with time to become more impressive? Maybe. I certainly hope so, but I don't know. Perhaps I'm forever trapped with heightened tonal memory. But I guess that's the overall point of this video. Can adults learn perfect pitch? Biardo's answer is a solid no, but my answer, which is supported by the literature, is a much more modest, we don't know. Thanks for watching. At the time of posting this, I'm running an absolute pitch training experiment. For the time being, there's a link to take part in this attached to the video. It would be great to have lots of you involved. Who knows, maybe you'll learn perfect pitch. If you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe to my channel. I spend most of my life as a professional jazz musician, so feel free to check out my music too. If you'd like to, then you can also support me on Patreon, details provided below. Before I go, I'd like to make it very clear that I have nothing but respect for the work of scientists such as Jenny Safran, Diana Deutsch, Lola Cuddy and Judith Gavain. If I seem overly critical in this video, this is just the nature of science. Collectively, we're on a dispassionate search for truth, but their work is so important to how our understanding of absolute pitch has developed. We owe them a lot. Thanks to Ian Cross, John Silas, Fernando Bravo and Ella Jeffries for their help and support in making this video. And of course, thanks also to Rick Biardo and Dylan for inspiring it.